watch. The reason we're both going to speak a little bit today is um, we, we're going to partly report to you um, on a, a significant event that occurred uh, in Los Angeles last Saturday, a week ago, where, and I think Lane is going to go through most of this. I, I might, but uh, we're not going to just give you a simple report because it would take too long. It was an event that went from 10 in the morning till 10 at night. And probably uh, in many ways, one of the most significant aspects was that, you know, as, as I'll reference, Lynn and Helga, who both spoke over electronic uh, media, they spoke on Skype. With a gigantic screen. screen. And they addressed the audience for about an hour and a half. And um, the basic theme was Lynn's uh, and Helga's point of go west, young man, the Pacific orientation it's called, but basically what's happened in the last period, and I think it's, it's important to get this right because, and you'll see, because I'm going to give you a little bit of an update, uh, and it's not a happy update at one level, but it's one that we really have to take seriously what we in the LaRouche movement have to do. Um, but what we've seen over the last couple of months is specifically coming from China, from the new leadership in China, which remember, these, they just came into office this year. Xi Jinping, Lei, Li Kui Kang, um, the, pr the president and the prime minister. These, they're a new uh, generation of leadership following Hu Jintao, Jiang Zemin, and so forth. Now, and then you have and they've been calling explicitly in the last couple of months. And this is a change. And I'll tell you in a minute why and how big the change is. Okay? They, they, Xi Jinping, in his visits to Indonesia, Malaysia, Russia, and Lane may go over more details, has been, you could say, proselytizing. He's been uh, a missionary for the Eurasian land bridge, explicitly by that name. The, uh, you know, the Silk Road, some of you may remember Helga uh, being called the Silk Road Lady back in the late 1990s in particular. And um, this is explicit. He's talking about special relations to Russia uh, and a complete change in orientation towards South Asia, Southeast Asia, virtually every country in one way or another except for the Philippines, which you'll see an interesting point of. We have a couple of videotapes. And really what we what was played at this conference, what was displayed at the conference, was the role that Lynn and Helga play in the minds of the Asian population, the leadership, the intellectual leadership of the Asian population. And we'll give you just a couple examples of this. Now let me so this was a powerful statement, as much as it was a good audience, a lot of good people, uh, but probably the strategically most significant element was the statements that came in, not only endorsing Lynn and Helga, but making the point that they have learned from Lynn and Helga. And you'll see this especially in the uh, video from uh, the Chinese representative. Uh, but uh, also some of the others you won't see because we can't, the time isn't available to show them all. There were also statements from a leading Japanese Economist, a guy named Katagawa, who has spoken at some of our conferences and sent a statement to this conference. Uh, and there was participation. Now, why did this happen? Because, see, here's the, there's sometimes uh, you find a certain, for want of a better word, um, a, a romanticism about Asia, you know, the, the mysterious Asia, a different place, a different culture. Um, and they, they do things, and we, we, you place a certain hope in the situation. Uh, some of it is justified, but some of it is a mistake. Why did, the, why did the Chinese, under Xi Jinping, why did they make this change? Because it's a big change. And you'll see what uh, uh, the representative said. But the basic point is, what's happened in China and in Russia? Well, put very simply, since the late 1980s, 
when you had the fall of the Soviet Union, the fall of the Berlin Wall, early 90s, the breakup of the Warsaw Pact. In a certain sense, China and Russia were oriented to the West, to the Western financial system. In short language, basically, the Chinese had an export policy based on cheap labor. So they were developing the coastal areas, Shanghai and, and so forth, these coastal enterprise zones, and basically exporting based on cheap labor. And this was part of the Western financial system. This was being promoted by London, by Wall Street, by the oligarchy, very explicitly. The, the point is, and this is what we're seeing the consequence of, that labor in the West cost too much. You had all these benefits, you had all these wage benefits, health benefits, and so on and so forth. And the idea was, because from an oligarchic standpoint, from a financial monetarist standpoint, there's no value in increased production. There's no value in technological advance. The only conceivable value that a monetarist would find in science is weaponry. Sometimes they realize they need the weapons because they might have to engage in a military expedition. But otherwise, they don't want progress. They don't want the population to develop. And so they, in this case, what they said is, you know, we're, we're massively in debt. You had the blowout of the savings and loans. You had the debt crisis of the third world in the 1980s. So what did they turn to? They exported, we call it outsourcing, but you know, they sent, essentially they destroyed the, much of the industrial West, including the United States, including in some ways Japan, including Europe with a few pockets of exceptions, and they exported it to Asia. In fact, you know, at a certain point, the Chinese also had to face the fact that there was cheaper labor in Bangladesh, cheaper labor in Indonesia. And indeed, they were being outbid on the cheap labor market. But that is only part of what happened. Now, what, what's, what really occurred is with the massive speculation of the 1990s and the early part of this century, the rate of accumulation of looting that was required by the Western financial system was really too great for anybody to handle. And trillions and trillions were being rolled over. Of course, the Chinese were buying American debt at a, at a fabulous rate, okay? So what happens? The, the, the system blew out in 2007, 2008. And anybody running a country like China has to deal with things on a much different scale. He can't say like the average person might, well, the system is dead, but I might make it. Hmm. I'm gonna put my money somewhere where it's okay. If you're running a 1.4 billion person country or a 1.2 billion person country like India, you don't have that luxury. Where is this population gonna go? How are you gonna deal with the poverty? Because if you don't, you're gonna have social upheaval. And they've had it before in China. So the Chinese basically recognize at this point, and I really don't think it's been until the recent point that indeed the policy of the 1990s and the first decade of this century was no good for China. They would not be able to develop. They wouldn't be able to continue the export policy because the markets in the West had collapsed. Europe has collapsed. The United States has collapsed in terms of the actual purchasing power of the population. It doesn't work anymore. They're slashing wages in the United States. They're going after entitlement. They're going after health care. Europe is the same thing. Take Greece, okay? They're destroying countries. And so the Chinese say, what do we do now? How can we survive this? Keep in mind, they've got close to one and a half trillion dollars in US Treasury bills. Now, what happens if the dollar collapses? Relative to, the, relative to the Chinese currency. 
Well, they lose a ton of money. They lose their investment. Because it's not about money. It's about what does it do. So the Chinese recognize, and then you have another element. We've seen the explicit statement by the Queen of England and her cohorts, Prince Philip, you know, this crowd, uh, that, the, the super environmentalists, okay, the Greens, these guys are completely crazy. All right, actually, I'll tell you something very ironic that might, I, I'm, I'm looking for the things that wake Americans up. Because, you know, Americans can be dense, okay? Now, uh, um, Correa and Morales, these are the presidents of Bolivia and Ecuador. I, I, yeah, Bolivia and Ecuador. Now, these guys are leftists, and they, they're basically anti-American. I'm not saying they're good people. But what's happened is they're now, they're explicitly saying that the environmentalists are out to destroy the population of Bolivia and Ecuador. They're not allowing any development. Every time they try, so guess what? Morales wants to go nuclear. Correa wants to go nuclear. They need nuclear power to upgrade the standard of living of their population. And they're being met with insanity from these environmentalists. So what you're getting, so the Chinese, imagine that on a larger scale. What are the Chinese here? The Queen of England, Prince Philip, the, you know, Wall Street in London, what are they committed to? Depopulation. They're committed to reducing the world population from 7 billion to maybe 1 billion, 1 and a half billion, half a billion. Depends on what nut you talk to. But they're all in that range. That, that was the Queen's excuse, last. Excuse, 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 oh, oh, okay. excuse, oh, oh. All right. right. Let him finish what he's finishing. Then you can okay. you know, ask questions after that. Okay. Don't interrupt. Just okay. Let him finish. So the, you know the, the Chinese are saying here. Here's some arithmetic for you. If we're going to reduce the world's population from seven billion to one billion, and the Chinese are 1.4 billion, how how many Chinese are you supposed to kill? I mean, if the only people left in the world were a billion Chinese, that would mean 400 million had been dead, had been killed. So the Chinese, the handwriting is on the wall. They could not tolerate this any longer. What happened with Russia? Even the Indians are coming around because the Indians are 1.1, 1.2 billion people. What's been their development by accommodating to the Western financial market? None. If they've been outstripped by China, and they, they now face the fact that they've got to develop. What about the Russians? Well, what happened to the Russians under Yeltsin in the 1990s? They were destroyed. They went bankrupt in 1998, 97, 98. They went into the financial markets. There was massive speculation in Russian government bonds, and the, the Russian economy collapsed. It was part of the collapse, the Asian collapse of 97, 98. What happened under, even under Putin, he tried to accommodate himself to the West. In fact, his leading financial expert, Kudrin, is a complete monetarist. He's still in. But Putin faced the reality that Russia was being surrounded. The US was not uh, willing to even negotiate over the ballistic missile defense. Their, their economy was a no-growth economy. They also held about a half a trillion dollars in US government debt. And so the Russians realized that they are under attack. And economically, financially, they can't survive the present system. So only in the last period have the Russians, the Chinese, changed orientation. They're looking, shall we say, west themselves, OK? Or, well, the Russians are looking east, the Chinese are looking west, because the Earth is round. But anyway, the, um, uh, so this has been a big strategic change, a major change. This exists, and this represents a basis for the United States, which would be the key element in this. No one should be deluded. And I tell you, the Russians and the Chinese are not. They just may be a little on the desperate side. 
there's no illusion on their part that they can do this without the United States and without salvaging something from Europe. The problem in Europe is you have no sovereignty, none whatsoever. They're run by the European Union. They have largely a single currency. The one functional economy still a little bit is Germany, and the Germans are under attack from London and from Wall Street. You know, they're not pouring enough money into the system. There's not enough bailout. Look, the US uh, system, the European system, is based on a bailout and a bail-in. The government bails it out, and if that isn't enough, they take deposits, they, they take uh, bonds, they take whatever. You look at this, this Obamacare, which I'm not going to go into too much detail on, okay, because it's been discussed, I know, extensively. But what is it? It's a bailout and a bail-in for the insurance companies, which are part of Wall Street. Mm -hmm. Why did you have the repeal of Glass-Steagall? Because the financial sector wanted to integrate itself. Remember, the first example was the, uh, uh, the merger of Travelers Insurance and Citibank. That was the specific merger that the Glass-Steagall repeal was meant to allow. So the whole idea, what are they doing? The idea is to merge these financial entities so that they have access to virtually the entire monetary liquidity of the global system. This is what we're dealing with. This is no small potatoes. So what's the idea of Obamacare? Well, if you had an insurance policy and it doesn't meet the, quote, standards, you either lose the insurance policy or you buy another one at a higher price because it's got so much good stuff in it for you. You know, <laughs> like if you're a 60-year-old woman, you need prenatal care and uh, so on and so forth. Now, you know, this is why you need a single-payer national insurance policy. Some people call that socialism. They got a screw loose. <laughs> this, you've just been bombarded with, you know, Churchillian propaganda. Churchill was prepared to, you know, he wanted the communists to lose more than he wanted the fascists to lose. The only problem he had with the fascists was they might under, uh, override England. The, uh, the empire, not really England, the empire. And that's what we're living with. So what is this, what happens? You lose your insurance. Let's, now, some people say 93 million people are going to lose their insurance. There's different e estimates. So what, but you have to buy insurance. Otherwise, you get penalized. So effectively, you're ordered to increase your payment to the insurance company. Now, on top of that, what happens to the people, the 7 or at, at 10 million, they say that they're going to put into the system? plus these people who lose their insurance. Well, if, you, if you're below a certain income and above a certain income, then you get a subsidy from the government. <laughs> so what's the subsidy? The subsidy is a pass-through from the government to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the person, to the insurance company. It's just, a, it's just basically a way to watch the money. You can say it's the person paying for their insurance uh, premium policy, but in fact, it's the government on a massive scale pumping money into Wall Street. Now, suppose you can't afford, suppose you make too much money and, you, and you're not gonna get a subsidy, but you still have to buy health insurance at a greater pay scale than your previous insurance. So now you have a bail-in. They're taking it directly out of the pockets of the citizenry. We estimate this at between 200 and 300 billion dollars. And that's on top of the cut in, uh, that they're implementing in medical care of about 500 billion at least over 10 years. And all this is basically a bailout or a bail-in. So the system is gone, completely gone. And you have to understand this to understand what I'm gonna get to because there's a dynamic here that is really not terribly well understood by Americans. And I must say, just for the purposes of this discussion, present company not excluded, we have to find out what we know. Because you've got a collapse of an entire system. A co you know, and, and then you have a, a legitimate question, why is Obama still the president? You know, this question has been raised, we may get, discuss it in, in the question and answer period. 
if you look at it, every decent American president, and let's say good American president, has, been, has died in office. Not only have they died in office, but a significant number have been killed in office, otherwise assassinated. Now you notice, the bad ones, nothing much terrible happens to them. <laughs> You know, Nixon got ultimately impeached because he was a little far gone. He was ahead of his time at a certain level. They weren't quite ready for the NSA in 1971. Today, they're ready for it. Today, they're going to implement th th this kind of policy on a global scale. That's what Nixon was up to. He was a little, you know, they didn't want it then. And there always are faction fights that go on in, at, at the leading levels. But you, know, you look at this, from the time of Andrew Jackson, which was a traitorous takeover, the closing down of the US Second National Bank, mm -hmm. the rise, really, of the slave policy in the South under Jackson, from that point on, not that it didn't happen somewhat before in the case of Hamilton, but it, from that point on, Lincoln was assassinated, Garfield was assassinated, McKinley was assassinated. FDR escaped both a coup and an assassination attempt. And Kennedy was assassinated. Now there's other suspicious cases of the ones that died in office. Harrison in the early 1840s. Zachary Taylor in the early eight, late 1840s, early 1850s. And Ta uh, Hardin uh, in the 20s, 23, okay? They were all suspicious cases. These guys sort of keeled over in office. Suppose, I mean, maybe it's possible. In one case, supposedly they ate cold milk and cherries, and somehow that overdid it. In another case, they shouldn't have given a speech in the rain. That was Harrison. And uh, you know, Taylor was a military guy, he, but I guess the cherry and the milk was too much for him. And then, of course, Harding died supposedly eating bad oysters somewhere in the Southwest. Uh, so. That, that's seven presidents, four of them assassinated. And, and the thing about Roosevelt, you might ask the question, well, why didn't he get assassinated? Because Roosevelt had a unique quality. And th that was that he named the enemy. He said, I'm fighting Wall Street. <coughs> and even the British. He told Churchill, we're not fighting a war to maintain your empire. And it was well known that he didn't trust the British. That was a saving grace. I would say in Lincoln's case, he, he knew it was the British, but frankly, they were so intent on killing Lincoln that they went, you know, about it. Remember, Lincoln, when Lincoln was killed, he wasn't the only one targeted. So this is where Americans are often never, never land on this stuff. We talk about lone assassins, and you say, well, Lee Harvey Oswald. John Wilkes Booth. Isn't it the case that most Americans think that Lincoln was killed by a, a lone assassin, John Wilkes Booth? Well, it's not true. Conspiracy. It's not true. It's the same night that Lincoln was assassinated, they had, a, they had Seward was attacked, the Secretary of State. His son was almost murdered, trying to defend his father. Seward was seriously wounded. And there was a, 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 a person whose target was Ulysses Grant, the head of the, U the Union Army. Grant, it turned out, did not go to the theater with Lincoln because his wife was sick. Otherwise, he was a target. This wasn't a lone assassin. It wasn't even a lone assassin that night. And Roosevelt had some idea of this. And you know, Lynn has raised the question, why did the American people let this happen? Why do the presidents feel they have to go out and do these, expose themselves? I'll tell you, take the case of Lincoln. When Lincoln came into his inauguration, he took a, he had some people who said, they're, they're gonna try to assassinate you. There's a team out to hit you. And so Lincoln sneaked in, he switched trains in Baltimore overnight, and he snuck into DC. Pretty clever, you know, he, he, yep. he outsmarted them. But what happened? He was vilified in the American press. 
for being a coward, for not facing and standing up to, the, to this attempt and so forth and so on. So it's the American people who often put pressure on. Why don't you have the guts to go out there and talk to the people? So you, you, have to, you have to realize how we've been fooled on this stuff. How we've been, uh, you know, <coughs> foolish on this stuff. And now we're faced with this situation. Look at Obama. I, I, I give it a good example. Obama, as every, I'll just give you this one. I'm not going to go through all the crimes of Obama because it, you know there's a few other points to be made, but. What did he say over and over? I mean, there's, there's video clips of this that are all over the place. He didn't say it once. He didn't say it twice. He said it over and over again. But it, and it's not that this is the biggest issue, but it's interesting. He said, I can assure you that if you want to keep your insurance policy, you can keep it. Mm -hmm. Trust me. Mm -hmm. OK, I'm a good guy. Mm -hmm. Trust me. Okay, so what happened? Now we find out that in 2010, they knew that millions couldn't keep their insurance. Obama knew. Now what does Obama do at this point? Well, he had some flunkies like Ezekiel Emanuel and <coughs> um, uh, Sibelius and so forth, the Secretary of Health. And they said, well, it's the insurance company's fault. And they, you know, we're sorry and this and that. And that didn't fly too well, since the whole thing was Obama's policy. So on Monday, Obama says, well, look, what I said was, if you want to keep your insurance, you can keep it, as long as there's no change in the law. Well, he never said that. That's a lie. What an underlying statement. It, it, it was a complete lie. He never said it. Look at the film clips, as they used to say in the sports world here, let's go to the videotape. And you'll find out that, you know, he, that isn't what he said. But it's a bald-faced lie. Then when this is shown, he says, well, if anyone was misled by my assurances, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay? And that's it, right? Yeah. Now, what happened? Nothing. They haven't taken Obamacare back. They haven't extended the mandate. Now, here's a perfect case. What is going on? How does this happen? Well, this is what happens when a citizenry thinks that it's all up to the powers that be. It's not up to me. I'm too small. I've got to save myself. And there's nothing left to save. The country, look, this country is going to hell in a wastebasket. That's right. Okay? Because the American population has let it happen. A good example is the Tea Party. Now, there are some people in there who might have some intentions. But look at the Republican Party. They're a bunch of jerks. They're about as dumb as wallpaper. Okay? And what are they pushing? Well, if you don't have insurance, any, any insurance, any national insurance policy is communism. And if you don't have insurance, get a job. <laughs> OK, there's 8% you know, unemployment officially, 15% underemployment. Where's the job? <laughs> well, if you, if you had that good old spirit, you could find a job in the capitalist world of dog eat dog. Well, that's not the, that has nothing to do with the American system. Where did FDR come from? He said, this is crap. I'm not going to put up with this. We're not going to let senior citizens and unemployed suffer. That's the same thing that Lincoln did. People have the wrong idea of what the United States is. You know, you know we're anti-immigrant. Where did the anti-immigrant policy come from? From Wall Street, from Long Island, from people like Harriman, Cold Harbor. Eugenics. Where did eugenics come from? The British, the Dutch. And Americans have tolerated this. You even get this situation among minorities. 
where, you know, Hispanics say it's the Chinese, the African Americans say it's the Hispanics, <laughs> you know, the Romanians say it's the Greeks, who knows what? Yeah? Where do we come in with the Chinese? Huh? What, what role do we play? With China? China. Yeah, we, the role that we play is the role that Lynn has already played, because the, they, they'll, you'll see, they, they see the whole, Ch Lane again, they, they'll see, they see the whole capability to change their policy is rooted in the ability to, of the United States to back that policy up, to go with Glass-Steagall, to reform the financial system, and so forth. So to the degree we raise that banner here, on Glass-Steagall, on LaRouche, they will be invigorated in their efforts to change their policy. So that's, you know, now, let me, let me take it to where we are, so that, you know, and to get a grasp of the situation. Because, as you may know, look, we're, we're sitting, and I, this is a, important for people to grasp. We're sitting at any moment that we're alive right now. We're sitting within hours or days or weeks of a potential thermonuclear war. Mm -hmm. Now, I can say, yes, we might, the world might go to hell in a financial crash. We already see food shortages, the food stamp cuts. You think about doing this on the, the Thanksgiving month. You're gonna cut food stamps the one month of the year that many of these families celebrate by being a little extravagant on food. It's supposed to be a day of Thanksgiving. They won't be able to do it because they're gonna run out of food stamps. That's already going on. So you can get social upheaval, but the, 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 and this is not separate from the threat of thermonuclear war. Because what's going on? The Wall Street, London, the financial elite, what are they saying? Populations are going to have to pay, they, we're going to stay within this monetary system, and the populations are going to have to pay, pay with blood and bone. We're going to cut services. We're going to let people die in hospitals or by not going to hospitals. If you're 65 years old, maybe your quality of life isn't going to be too good, so we're not going to treat you with these things. We're going to cut off food production. We're not going to have water management, and so on and so forth. So people, what, what, what causes most initial upheaval? Food shortages? You know, Egypt. What started the so-called Arab Spring? Food riots. Mm -hmm. Then there's subsidies on uh, you know, transportation. Things that keep people, uh, they can't even get to their jobs. So the, 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 the financial policy of a collapse is pushing countries and populations to the brink of conflict. So what's the typical way of dealing with this? Divide and conquer. Who's your enemy? Your next door neighbor? The immigrants? The Chinese? India, that's the enemy? Russia, that's the enemy? And so they get people to engage in these kinds of conflicts. They threaten Russia and China. Oh sure, they're after Syria. But who's backing Syria? And they knew that in the beginning. The Russians. So when you go at Syria, you're going at the Russians. Now this is insanity. Now what's, and you take it right up to the present, even up to the last night webcast that Lynn did. Because look, this week, there's an effort to start negotiations with Iran. The P5 plus one started, it was already begun, I think Thursday and Friday they got together. Kerry was there, Fabius, the foreign minister of France, and Lavrov showed up from Russia. Now, uh, this, you have to have the stage set. At the same time, there's the possibility of a negotiation over Syria. Geneva, too, when the Russians came in and said, we'll guarantee that the Syrians give up the chemical weapons. And the Syrians have given up the chemical weapons even though the, the August 21st incident 
has never been proven to be the present Syrian regime. It, 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 many people think it was at least a segment of the opposition. But nonetheless, they gave up the chemical weapons. And there's no doubt the Russians, the Iranians, were behind uh, pushing in this direction. So we have a negotiation over Syria. Now, what's happened since then? The Israelis, under Netanyahu, are saying, we don't want this. You know, it, 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 there's got to be more sanctions on Iran. There's got to be a tougher policy on Syria, and so forth. Now, keep in mind, you know, uh, when I said American presidents in particular are targeted, and it's true. The British, the Dutch, the financial sector is against the, the American Republic because of its history. And that's, Lynn is going through it. I'm not going to try to go through it. But this goes back to the Renaissance, when leading figures in the Renaissance knew that Europe was going to fail, was failing. And Cusa and others said, let's go to the new continent. And since then, they, the, the European oligarchy has been against this. But let's look also at the situation, let's say, you know, King was assassinated. Patrice Lumumba was assassinated. Other leading figures in the non-aligned movement, Indira Gandhi and her son, and Mohandas Gandhi. Key German bankers? Hmm? Key German bankers? Yeah, key German bankers like Herrhausen. All assassinated. A lot of lone assassins running around the world. Okay? All of them gone. So what do you have now? You have Netanyahu, this guy, you know, who's, who thinks his mission in life is to destroy Iran. You know, the whole family, his father was a nut. Only he lived to be like a hundred and some odd years old. His father was the guy who wrote the history of Jews in Europe, Spain, and said, look, there's simply an anti-Semitic strain in, in Europe, period. And this is what you get among some of these Israeli fatalists. Okay, on the other hand, who else was assassinated? Rabin, a guy who was a hardliner who finally wanted peace. And he was assassinated by who? A right-wing Israeli. And everybody knows it wasn't a lone assassin. This was the policy of the same wing in Israeli politics that Netanyahu endorses. Now, what else is going on? The Saudis. The Saudis are pissed off. Excuse my language, but the, Sa the Saudis are angry. Okay? What are the Saudis saying? The U.S. should have bombed Syria. And of course, the Saudis are, are in particular behind a great deal of the fundamentalist upheaval in the Middle East. They funded the madrasas during the Afghan uh, war and so forth. They funded the Mujahideen. They were involved in 9-11. Mm -hmm. Now what are they saying? We want to lead a separate assault on Syria. And since we can't trust the United States any longer, we want nuclear weapons. Prince Torki, the former head of their intelligence, was interviewed on, in the Washington Post over the weekend. And he was asked, do you guys want nuclear weapons? He said, I think. The Gulf Cooperation Council, uh, countries, and uh, yes, we want nuclear weapons. And so what did the Saudis do? This is typical. Because the Saudis don't have a great depth of intellectual capability. It's a, it's a, it's a monarchy. Most of the people in, in Saudi Arabia are suppressed, to say the least. Okay, it's not just women, though. The treatment of women is problematic. But what do they want to do? They went to Pakistan, and they told the Pakistanis, we'll help you fend off sanctions on oil and so forth, but, and, and allow you to build up your nuclear arsenal. But we want our part of the nuclear arsenal. In other words, the Saudis are buying nuclear capability from the Pakistanis. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they actually paid Saddam Hussein $5 billion in the 1980s but he never succeeded in developing a nuclear arsenal. 
So, this, so you had the Saudis going, essentially what we call a breakaway ally potential. <coughs> this is supposedly an ally of the United States, but it may go on its own policy to war. Or the Israelis might set it off. But actually, there's a whole bunch of things that might set it off. There's China and Japan. There's India and Pakistan. There's the Balkans. There's Northern Africa. We're sitting on a process that despite whatever people's intention may be, you know, people are saying, well, would they intend to do that? Frankly, who gives a damn? You know, as, you know, Rhett Butler said to Scarlett O'Hara, <laughs> you know, frankly, I don't give a damn. If, whether they intend it or not, and some of them do, there's certainly a faction in, in the British uh, Anglo-Dutch oligarchy that intends nuclear war. But there's a lot that don't. But they intend to keep the empire. And you have to look at the Anglo-Dutch and the Saudis. You could say the faction in London that's tied into the Saudis, who play a certain role in this. As, as we've said, we have the, you know, you can, uh, this, the material we've got on 9-11. But the fact is that you've got a globe that's being pushed to nuclear war. Now, what happens with these negotiations? What's already happened? The negotiations are not bad under normal circumstances. They could go in the right direction. Some people are, are genuinely afraid of nuclear war. It makes sense. OK. But you have people pushing this and things go out of control. And you get nuclear holocaust. You get nuclear war. So what happens? What if these negotiations don't work? Or what if somebody doesn't like the outcome? For example, suppose we solve the Iran question, or begin to solve it. Do the Saudis go aid? Do the Israelis bomb Iran? And what happens then? What does the US do if the Israelis bomb Iran. And what do the Russians do? What do the Chinese do? Or suppose the negotiations fall apart. I'll give you an example that we have already, uh, according to reports we have as of this morning. You, know, you have all these, uh, as I said, you have Bob Yusin in, uh, I think the negotiations are in Vienna on the Iran case, or maybe it's Geneva. At any rate, Bob Yusin is there, Kerry is there. Lavrov came because the negotiations were not going well. Fabius is demanding that the Israeli concerns be taken into account. They're not even there. If you take Israel into account, the negotiations are over. Except to say, you know, we're not going to let anybody bomb Israel. They, okay. But that's about it. So what if the Syrian negotiations fall apart? If there's a demand from the Saudis, and the, they back the opposition, and they say, no negotiations unless Assad steps down, those negotiations are over. We're back to square one. Or we, I should say we're probably not back to square one. We're a lot closer to nuclear war. So this is the, uh, the essential issue, that the whole system it's a social, general, breakdown, civilizational crisis now. You see bits and pieces of it. The economic collapse. The trade collapse. Look at the situation we have. Syria, they have the first outbreak of polio since 1999. Now, of course, you have a situation where the children in Syria are not being vaccinated. It's not easy to get a vaccination in the middle of a civil war. This threatens to spread throughout North Africa. They're going to try to in in inoculate 20 million younger people in the next eight months in Syria, Le uh, Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, Turkey. Now, here's something to consider. Where does the polio virus come from? It's endemic in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Where do the foreign forces that are fighting in Syria come from? 
Some of them come from Pakistan and Afghanistan. The question is raised, is that where the polio came from? On top of a population that's being decimated. Now, if you let yourself think about it, it's a devastating situation. Most people don't want to think about it. The Chinese, last week, made it very public for the first time. I don't know if military intelligence knew this or not, but the public for the first, they made public for the first time that they have a strategic nuclear submarine capability. In other words, they can launch mm -hmm. missiles from submarines that can reach the west coast of the United States, and in other circumstances, land-based missiles that can reach the east coast of the United States, and they estimate that they can uh, get an immediate destruction of 12 to 15 million people. Now, why did they make this public now? Because they want, they, not because they're going to use it against us, but because they want the Western powers to know that if they're targeted, if they're forced to defend themselves, this is what they have. Now, of course, the Russians, yeah, here's something that you got to consider also. The Russians, what do they have? They don't have a conventional force, not of a, not of a substantial sort. They're not going to match the US, et cetera, NATO on a conventional forces basis. They're not going to engage in little conflicts. China knows that they don't have the conventional capability. But what do the Russians have? They have a massive nuclear capability. Now, their problem is use it or lose it. In other words, if they sit and wait too long, they suffer the possibility of having their nuclear force significantly diminished. So they've got to make a decision. If they're under threat, do they use the nuclear weapons? That's their essential decision. The Chinese may have a slightly different standpoint, but they're saying, if we're attacked, we defend our population. So you're, at a, you're on a hair trigger, like parts of the Cold War. You're essentially back to the early 1980s, when the uh, NATO had intermediate range missiles five minutes from Moscow. Five minutes flight time from Moscow. And so they were, pre they were preparing a first strike. And indeed, the, the buildup of the SDI in the United States forced the Soviets essentially into a flight forward, and it crashed their economy, because they, their, their economy had too many problems. Now we're essentially at the same point on a much more fractured situation. The global financial situation is far worse. Now, at this point, Americans have to think of something. Instead of this idea that we're, uh, you know, uh, impervious, that we've got this super military capability. You know, remember what Hitler was like at the end of the war, Wunderwaffen. They were going to win the war with miracle weapons. Now, Americans tend to think we've got miracle weapons. We can't be touched. It's not true. If you unleash a nuclear war <coughs> with the arsenals available to the United States, to the Russians, to the Chinese, secondary levels of arsenals in India and Pakistan, Israel, you have the, the potential to wipe out the human species or to send it so far back it may never recover. Because the way, the way extinction occurs is not the way people think. It's not that 7 billion people get killed overnight. You know, an hour and a half is about how long the exchange would last. But what happens? Radiation disease? But what more? You don't have people who can maintain cities. Sanitation, water management, food, disease. You set in motion a spiraling downward collapse. 
And that's what we face. And let me tell you something. People think it's military. It's not the military. There are good military and bad military. After World War II, who were the biggest opponents of general warfare? Douglas MacArthur. When he, when he toured the country when he was 75 years old in the 1950s, he said, look, the one lesson we can learn from what happened in World War II, the devastation, and what we saw with Hiroshima and Nagasaki was that if we ever had a general war again with these kinds of weapons, the human species wouldn't survive. What did Eisenhower say? The same thing. What did some of the scientists who worked on this, even Oppenheimer, who may have been a questionable character, who was the father of the atomic bomb, said, we can't do this anymore. What did Einstein say, who wasn't directly involved? We can't, we can't have this kind of thing. It's out of control. Nuclear power can be, has peaceful uses that are a benefit to mankind, but nuclear war is a disaster. Now, the fact of the matter is, even as these negotiations go on, which could be for the good, we have to recognize that the dynamic in the world is such that if they, we have to be clear, we have to be uh, clear at that we will not allow the use of nu not only nuclear weapons, but the policies, the process, the system. This has to go, and it has to go now. That means we have to implement Glass-Steagall. Not because one policy simply solves the problem, but because you have to get rid of Wall Street. You have to get rid of London. You have to get rid of the monetarist system. You have to go beyond the point where you're worried that if Wall Street goes, you lose your pension. Your pension is lost. But even more importantly, the future of humanity could be lost. The future of your children and grandchildren. And as you know, the, 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 the billions of unborn children, yet unborn, the future is lost. And so that's why we have a mission here that's totally different. Yes, we need glass people. We've got to organize it from the standpoint that it's essential to the survival of the human species. And we need to remove Obama. And you, know, you get the same thing. Well, how are we going to remove Obama? It's too late. He's already, et cetera, et cetera. No, you can't have that view. It's not a question of whether it's practical. It's a question of whether it's necessary. Practicality kills people. People in Europe were practical during the 1930s. 20 million Russians died. Millions of Germans. Six million Jews. Two to four million Slavs. Half a million gypsies mm -hmm. died because people were too practical. So it's a very, it's not a pleasant situation. It's an ugly situation. And there's no way to make it pretty. It's a little bit like they say this, the expression goes, putting lipstick on a pig. It doesn't make the pig pretty. So putting lipstick on this strategic situation is not going to make anybody look good or feel better. You, and you got to look at things like Glass-Steagall or the removal of Obama as existential questions. Not nice things, not an issue. And you got to face the fact that you've got cowardice in the Congress, and it's not going to change unless the population gives up its littleness. Mm -hmm. We're a republic, you gotta, you gotta say to these guys, you listen to us, we hired you. And that's where we stand. 